when anybody wants to move up to the middle class in any society, any culture, the personal psychic space becomes smaller and the tone of voice is leveled off and the body language is calmed down and everybody wants to play up to this European mindset role model. And I've come from that and I know it doesn't make you happy. When, when I first came to London and the Brotherhood of Breath were my idols for me when I was like 19 years old, just like, oh, 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 you know, I listened to that take my breath was still. <laughs> I left South Africa, I was about 19, and I went to live in England. One of the people that influenced me a lot was a journalist, a sort of left-wing journalist. And I began to see life in a different way because we are, in South Africa we're so, we were so incredibly cut off from the world. There was no television, there was no radio, the, the, the newspapers had blank pages. We never got any real news of the world. All we heard was what the government told us. And we, they believed, everyone believed it, you see. They believed that um, Africans who wanted their civil rights were actually a communist plot and the place was surrounded in Russian submarines. My father actually believed that. The government very cleverly separated Indians into Indian section and Africans into Khorsa into a Khorsa section, Zulus into a Zulu section. It was divide and rule, which is which is what always been their policy. So I went back in um, in about sixty three or so, sixty three, sixty three. In the context of that, a friend called uh, David he, he said, "Oh, there's this English, this white journalist who plays with blacks, and he's putting on a concert in." Dorkey House, you know, she should come along. So he took me, and, I, and when I got there, I just was knocked out by the music, completely knocked out. I was working as a journalist, sort of a journalist at the time, and I went to my editor and I said, I want to, um, I'd like to interview him. So he sent me to do an interview with Chris, and I met Chris, and um, it was just, you know, as if we'd always known each other, in any fact, of one of those meetings. So I couldn't think of anything else after that. Well, the thing, the thing about me is that I'm um, a scorpion, and they do say scorpions have ideals. Music was his thing, but I believed in it, but it wasn't my thing, you know. I did it because it was his thing, and I loved him. And because of, because of that, I put every, every, all my energy into doing it and making it work, and I, and I looked everywhere for answers and scraped and saved and what have you. And we decided that the best thing to do for the Blue Notes would be to try and leave the country because they'd never get a, an audience otherwise. South Africa was banned from being visited by overseas musicians and the music didn't go out, of course. And we thought, if we go out with this wonderful music and play it to the world, they'll know what's happening here. And we, we, we realised it was the only way it would survive because it was just so dangerous trying to play on an expand at the time. You've got, you've got, you know, you could be held up by the police any time. If you put on a concert, they would, the police could stop the concert and say um, it's not allowed. And so the no entrepreneurs would dare to um, finance you because they knew that it was risky. So it was, a t it was a, you know, they, they couldn't make any money. There was just no money in music at all. This money on this thing? What? We're getting paid? Did you hear that? It's on camera, man. It's really great to see some very, very beautiful places here from old and new. I wish this was my fan. I saw my audience. It's coming up for 50 years. So, um, brain cells fade for the two years. So, 
And um, the next thing we're going to do is a tune called Sweetest Honey. But we used to call it in the band Sweetest Harry. And we six of our effects in the days. I'm David DeFries, trumpet, flugelhorn, alto horn, and cowbell in the Brotherhood of Breath. And I met Chris in 1979. He invited me to join the Brotherhood of Breath in 1981. And I don't think I've missed one concert since then. Once I was playing piano at the old 606 club. Don't, can't play piano very well, but I was playing a little piano. And Chris came over, oh, no, try this, try this. Oh, and all the African bands I worked with, they would say, no, not this, it's this. It's not, it's we want this. Very precise. And they told me, what is what? I never had that in jazz from a European mindset. Now, in the free period, um, I was in the second edition of the Brotherhood of Breath since 1981, and Chris didn't reject the free players. There were some of them there. They didn't like the new thing. It was all written and soloing on chord changes and in time, in the groove, in the pocket. Um, people would come up to me and say, can Chris play? Because it was the free period and everyone was just blowing. If anything, Chris always took a back seat and enhanced through his piano accompaniment the soloist, or whoever was playing. And on the gigs we did, Chris would always wind down his solos to make a, a, a plateau for the next soloist to enter. So the, you know, audience applauds when you end your solo on a like, on, a, on an orgasm, and then come back. But Chris was very tantric, you know? He held it back, and musically speaking, and, um, and made a plateau for the next solos. And I never heard people applaud Chris's solos very much. It was astounding. I never got bored playing the same parts because I was listening to Chris's uh, piano accompaniment of his orchestrations, and every night they were different. When I bought an E-flat alto horn, he started writing for it immediately. And as Frank said on the gig in the pool last night, um, you know, any, anybody who came with another instrument, oboe or whatever, Chris, um, he, he mentioned your father, Robert Juritz. Your dad turned up with a bassoon and, and there, there it was, there it was in the repertoire. There's nothing else like it. You know, the voicing, um, the counterpoint, the composition, there's not a wasted note. Well, everyone has a lyrical part. Everyone's got a moving part. That was Chris's thing. And that's why everybody, every single musician, enjoys playing his music. Um, and it sounds so vital. Sight reading was never a necessary attribute. Chris would go for hours on the piano with somebody who couldn't read music till they got their part right. Rehearsals were 10 hours a day until everybody was comfortable and there was no stopping like in the European sense saying, oh, that's a sharp or that note's short, let's start again from the top, one, two, three, four. Oh. The whole cycle would keep going round and round and round. You know when you've made a mistake, but you're never cutting the energy flow. I think people love this music because it brings something natural, deep and fresh. This music opens up the neurological pathways, you know? The philosophy behind the music the people are so yearning for. The actual way of living is so un-Eurocentric. He was actually an amazing person. He was a bit larger than life, I say it myself. They, they all work, you do do them, they work. 
They were, they were extraordinary people. He had power, you see. That, that, that can only explain it. Um, and when you reach those levels of perception, you learn to be very responsible with them and unselfish and harmless. And I found in general amongst the South African community a tremendous tolerance. I learned this, this incredible level of inclusion. So I realize now that a lot of the guys I knew, I mean, they were traumatized. Despite everything, I've never known a community more inclusive than the South Africans. And the white people who were against apartheid, you know, like total inclusion, um, tolerance, patience, because they knew what everybody was working through. They knew what people had come from. The first South African group I joined in 1976, I was asked by Julian Bahula, Jabula. I'd started having a few mystical experiences and I wasn't very discreet with them. So all the white musicians were calling me, oh, it's Cosmic Dave. The Julian's band, they said, I'm the Isangoma of the band, the, the witch doctor of the band. I was ridiculed in London, and I tell everybody, um, thanks to my friendship and the generosity of spirit of the Africans and West Indians I've known and know, um, I've recovered from my British stiff upper lip upbringing. For so many musicians, um, even people like Becky and Sibir, who, when they play, it's played through them. Do you know what I mean? The veil is a bit torn, the veil between the world, if you like. But they do see, they see a bit through the other side, you know. I think, I think musicians are interpreters of, of, of the spiritual world, really, in a way. And I mean, Chris even said, if, if my muse didn't work, I, I wouldn't be able to play. It just, it just happened. What kind of cue was that? One time they were traveling and they had to go to Austria somewhere. They were traveling in two mini, mini cars and they stopped for a drink somewhere and um, Dudu got involved in something like that and both the mini cars thought he was in the other one and so they went off again and Dudu was left in the, the middle of nowhere. He didn't have a coat, he didn't have his passport, he had nothing. He'd just been having a drink and chatting to somebody and he comes back and finds the minibuses have gone and they traveled a thousand kilometers before they found out that he wasn't in the other one. So, can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine? He didn't have a visa for, for Austria somewhere. So we got turned back and, and we had to take the long way round. So no sound check. We made the gig. Or we tried hiding him under the back seat. It did, did, didn't work. I mean, all these visa problems the South Africans had and Africans in the band traveling in Europe. There were other tours. There were one tour when the, the bus broke down on the way and they had to sell for a new bus and I got a picture of them all lying on the side of the road. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was not without incident. <laughs> Put it in the train. <laughs> I feel they have to go. <laughs> I'd love to see this music reach a younger audience and a younger generation of musicians to play it. I mean, I'd prepare, be prepared to step aside one day and pass it on to a younger player. And I've got no time for nostalgia. Chris has been gone 28 years. Maxine wrote her book and moved on. It was posing it. You know, it was um, going through your life and um, writing it down so that you can then step back and say, okay, well, that's what happened to me. And I can choose either to be in that and, and try and wish it was still there, even if it's not, or you can choose to move on and do something else because there's no point in always wanting something to be which isn't. Could you go with the flow, don't you? Could you go with the flow? <laughs> 
the, the, work, the life of people has been made by several and they succeed to create a history, music, films, the Music is happening now. Such great music. I mean, let's pass it to a younger generation.